Okay. Um, um, so I'm going to start by by saying where we are in the book. I'm going to from now on. I'm going to be doing that at the beginning of every lecture. Right now, it's kind of easy because we're at the beginning. <laughs> but but actually, I want to say what I can, which is not much about the overall structure. So after the, the preface and the introduction, because the main part of the book is divided into two doctrine of elements and the doctrine of the method. So um, like many of the divisions within this book, this one is very unequal. The doctrine of elements is really, really long and the doctrine of the method is much shorter. And all the reading for this class is from the doctrine of elements. Um, sometimes when there's enough class meetings at the end, I, I read, uh, I sign the canon for pure reason, the doctrine of the method, but not this year. So, um, what that means by these two things is a little bit unclear to me, or maybe a lot unclear to me. <laughs> Um, you know, when he discusses it at the end of the introduction, he just says, uh, this transcendental philosophy, or this, this science of critique of pure reason has, contains a doctrine of elements and a doctrine of a method. <laughs> That's the explanation. I know that, um, that like logic textbooks in Kant's time had a doctrine of elements and a doctrine of a method. And the elements are concepts, judgments, and syllogisms, which are inferences. Um, but it doesn't seem like those are the elements here. So I'm not sure what the elements are. <laughs> the doctrine of the method, I guess, I mean, so the doctrine of elements doesn't have its own introduction here. Like it says doctrine of the elements and then first part transcendental is that there's no introduction to the doctrine of the elements. There is a doctrine introduction to the doctrine of the method, but I don't find it very helpful. I mean, Kant says like we have to explain how a system of pure reason like can be erected, but then the doctrine of the method is divided into various parts of it. It's really hard to understand why they're all have to do with that or how they go together. Um, so anyway, uh, there's, ob there's obviously something, probably something important I don't understand, but fortunately we're not going to run into it much in this course because we're staying in the doctrine of the elements, right, or doctrine of elements. I mean, sometimes I say, so the doctrine of elements is divided into two parts, transcendental aesthetic. The transcendental logic. And, uh, you know, almost every part of the book starts with transcendental, so often I'm going to be shut out from talking about But there's two parts the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. Again, this division is really unequal. The transcendental aesthetic is really short, and, you know, uh, the first part of it was the reading for today and the rest of it is beginning of the reading for next time. <laughs> and then we're going to be in the transcendental logic. So the transcendental logic is, is most of the book. Um, and sometimes I used to say, well, maybe these are the two elements, aesthetic and logic. But um, I actually wrote here on the top of my notes, what are the elements, the doctrine of elements? Last year I said that aesthetic and logic are the elements. That can't be right. <laughs> so, I don't think it's right, but I don't know what is right. Um, so, um, but anyway, I, I mean, I can't explain what the difference between these two parts is. Right? These have to do with Reason, intellect, understanding, um, 
right? These have to do with the, the two fundamental powers or faculties that Kant thinks we need in order to have knowledge. Um, so he's going to talk about something about the faculty of sense first, and then a lot about the faculty of reason. And I mean, not surprisingly, the, the title of the book is Critique of Pure Reason. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and moreover, both of these answer part of the question, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? This one is supposed to this one is basically supposed to explain how mathematical knowledge is possible, right? That's um, that's the part of the answer we get out of the transcendental aesthetic. And again, as I said before, Kant thinks that's the easy part. Right. So, I mean, that's reflected in the fact that the transcendental aesthetic is short. Um, whereas this one is going to be about metaphysics. And this is the part that I keep that I that I'm thinking of when I keep saying about half of the book is going to be the positive project of showing, showing how a certain kind of metaphysics is possible and even developing its fundamental principles. And then about half of the book is going to be the negative project of showing how another kind of metaphysics, transcendent metaphysics, is impossible, but why we keep trying to do it in fact. Um, like trying to correct, should find the error that we make in. It, it, it makes us keep thinking that we can do it, um, right? So that so really, those are two parts of the transcendental logic. But like I said, the transcendental logic is most of the book, uh, right? And this aesthetic comes from eisthesis, which is the Greek word for sense, and the logic comes from logos, which is the Greek word for reason, or the prime. Should say it the other way around. Sense and reason are our translations of the Greek words eisthesis and logos. <laughs> right? It started in Greek. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, okay. And so, where we are in the book is here. All right. Are there questions about that before I go on? I'm going to erase this. Going to get more informative as we get farther into the book. Question? Yes. Oh, question. Yes. What effect uh, did him writing a critique of pure reason have on his like ethical theory, if at all? Well, it's, um, as I said when I lectured about the preface, um, in some sense, at least by the time he writes the the second edition, the B edition, thinks the whole purpose of the book is to make, is to keep meta theoretical metaphysics from interfering with the possibility of ethics. So it's very closely tied to his moral philosophy. Um, but uh, but I mean, we'll see more detail in more detail as. Like when we get, especially it's a transcendental dialectic, and he talks about the possibility of freedom. Yeah, it would be clear. Um, the canon of pure reason, which is part of the doctrine of the method that I sometimes assign, is all actually about his moral philosophy. So, uh, uh, which again, this makes it hard to understand why it's stuck in as one part of one ever five in this doctrine of the method, but there it is. That's actually the, the first thing he wrote about his moral philosophy before he published the groundwork in the second critique. Um, okay. Um, so and I think, by the way, that it's hard to understand, you know, like, if you want to know what he means by an end in itself, which is such a central feature of his moral philosophy, um, you you know, 
you have to compare it to what he said says about things in themselves here and why from a theoretical point of view we can't we, our, the object of our theoretical faculty is not things in themselves right so like um, um that's just an example but maybe the most important one but i think uh understanding his theoretical philosophy i mean in like they weren't just two separate projects it's, it's the same person who's doing both of them, thinking about them both at the same time that's actually for example that's less true of Locke, even though he, he does discuss his moral philosophy also in that essay, but all right sorry <laughs> i'm getting too far field all right um so especially because i know i'm going to run out of time at the end of this lecture so <laughs> um all right so my plan is my plan is that first I'm going to discuss what intuition, sensibility, and sensation are, and how they're related to thoughts and constants, right? So it's like all these sense, sensation, et cetera. What do all these things mean? Um, and then secondly, Try to explain what he means, I guess, intuition is probably the most important term. And then, secondly, I want to try to explain what he means by pure intuition or a pure form of intuition. And what he means when he claims that space and time are the, the pure forms of intuition, pure forms of our intuition. And then thirdly, but this is the part I might run into this time, I want to discuss Kant's argument in the transcendental aesthetic by which he's trying to show that space and time are the pure forms of our intuition, right? So like first I have to try to explain what it even means to say that there are two forms of intuition. And then hopefully if I get through that, I can start talking about his, like, because, right, there's a bunch of arguments that are supposed to show us the transcendence thing, and they're not easy to understand. All right, so that's the plan. We'll see how far I get. All right. Um, okay, so first of all, um, I want to talk about what a representation is. So a representation is um, something that exists. It's a kind of being. <laughs> um, uh, it's a special kind of being. It's the kind that Descartes and Spinoza call an idea. It's not exactly the same as what Locke calls an idea, although there, there's some close relationship between them. Um, but it's pretty much exactly what Descartes and Spinoza call an idea. Um, and we'll see in the Transcendental Dialectic when Kant introduces his own use of the term idea, he has a little rant about how wrong it is to use it to mean this because <laughs> it, it, it should be reserved for something else. All right, so um, so basically Kant's term for that is representation. He didn't make that up. It's a, it's a medieval term, but um, so anyway, um, what kind of being or thing is a representation? Well, um, so like every being, it has its own um, essential quality. Um, this is what Kant calls its Beschaffenheit. Which is which he generally uses as a translation of the Latin word qualitas, right? So that's why I say it's it's quality, right? It's essential quality. Unfortunately, Kemp Smith doesn't translate this consistently at all. 
Um, it's not going to cause so much of a problem in this case, but like eventually trying to keep track of this is hard because he translates it sometimes as nature, sometimes as constitution, sometimes as character, um, never as quality, as far as I know, which is probably how it should be translated. Anyway, so right, it has its own essential quality, which makes it what it is. And what is it? Well, it's a mode of thinking thing. For people who were just in one or B, this should sound, all sound for them. Right? It's a mode of, and actually for people who want to see, it should also sound for them. Um, so like, here's a mind, a thinking thing. Um, and uh, it has, um, a certain kind of property, something that adheres in it. And this is a representation. So, so the quality, the essential quality that makes the representation what it is, is a, a kind of mode of a thinking thing of our mind, right? That's what it is considered in itself. Um, and this relationship it has to the mind is the relationship of a, a quality being in a subject. So it's like uh, the relationship between the shape of the table and the table. The table is the subject and the shape of the table is the quality that's in that subject or that that subject has. You can right here, you can think of subject like the subject of a sentence. Right? It's something that you say something about. I mean, this comes from Aristotle. And again, if, 100, if you're in 100B, you can remember where this comes from in the categories and whatever. But, uh, but I mean, the reason I'm emphasizing that is because, therefore, the character of this thing that makes it what it is, is it's. Um, one name for it is that it's it's subjective reality. Right now, so so like again, subject is not a, is not a synonym for mind here. So the table is also a subject of its properties, right? But the but nevertheless, it's true that when you ask what is this thing, you're asking. What is a mode, this mode, what kind of mode of this subject is this? So that can be called its subjective reality. Um, also, and this is terminology that Kant probably has from Descartes, although Descartes got it from Suarez and, you know, who knows where it started exactly? This also you can call it its formal reality, right? It's it's the reality it has by virtue of the form that's in it that makes it what it is. So I mean, so for most things like the shape of the table, for example, you don't have to use special terms for this subjective or formal reality. The shape of the table just is a property that's in a certain subject, the table. And when you when you ask, like, what's its thingness? What makes it the kind of thing it is? Right? And reality, as I always have to ask, emphasize over and over, realitas comes from the Latin word race, which means thing. Right? Yeah, like what kind of thing is it? Well, it's a, you know property of uh, the subject, it's, you know, it, um, it has to do with the way it's limited by other bodies or, you know, something like that, right? You could try to explain what kind of property that is, but I mean, it doesn't have any other kind of reality besides its subjective reality. It's formal reality, that is the, real the reality that it has as what it is, is its subjective reality, that is its reality that it has as a, as a mode of the table. Um, and that's the whole story. 
But a representation is a weird kind of being because um, it refers or points to something outside of itself. Right, this is reference. So, um, Kant uses the uses the verb "bitzian" in German to mean what we usually now mean by "refer." Um, actually, I think probably our current use of "refer" is actually this. Our use of it in philosophy is actually a reflection of someone having decided to translate this word, this word, word, word. <laughs> um, because, like in older English, um, refer and relate were kind of interchangeable. Um, all right. So anyway, um, uh, the reason I have to say that is because Hamp Smith translates the CM as relate. <laughs> and he translates the noun but seeing as relation. Right? So in this translation, we'll we'll say a ref uh, representation relates to something outside of itself. But that relation is the relation we usually call reference. <laughs> um, and the the thing that it refers to outside of itself, the thing that it's about is called its object. I hope this isn't getting too complicated to um, feel like I wrote these things in bad places. Yes. Uh, for an independent agent, so like I'm a perceiver and that is the table, right? Am I able to access the subjective and internal reality of the table or am I only able to access the representation? In the reality where it's such a yeah. um well so this is your access to the table <laughs> okay you access the table by representing it right now i mean uh uh what does that say about what kind of thing you can know about and whatever, right? That's what the book is basically about, right? Um, but um, because I'm just going to say, you know, what the table is is, a, is an object of empirical representation. And it's, you know, and it's, that is what he calls a phenomenon. And because of that, we can know certain things about it. So, no. Uh, but I'm get, but I don't want to get into details of that yet. All right. So because I'm just because like it's not only Kant who has this picture, right? As I was just saying, you know, like the rationalists have this picture, the empiricists have this picture, the um this but moreover, like this term object here comes from a deonymous from Aristotle, right? So this is like an old, old way of thinking about things. Yeah. I'm sorry, this is like preemptive or something, but in this note in my book, it says that um, uh, with the exception of four cases in the final section, uh, throughout the transcendental study, Kant characteristically uses the term uh, for help use, noting a relation among objects rather than fixed uh, Um. Well, um, well, I mean, he uses both those terms, but seeing and their helpness, but uh, I believe when he means reference, he uses but seeing. Um, so uh, I think you'll find that those cases are the cases where he means this. <laughs> but um, um, I mean, this is a relation. Right, it's a relation between this and this, but it's a it's a it's a particular important relation, the relation of reference. Right. So, like, but what I was trying to explain here is that, like, um, to emphasize here is the meaning of the word object. Right. An object is so. There's all these things that I end up having to say in every class for some reason. So here it goes in this one to explain what object means. 
So, right, I mean, nowadays we use object as like a synonym for thing or being, right? Like we say, you know, what's that object over there? How many objects are on the table or whatever, right? But, um, but originally object is a relative term. If you call something an object, you have to ask object of what? And the answer is always object of some representation. Um, right? So to be the object of something is to be what it's about. And we do sometimes still use object, right? When we say, like, what's the object of this plan or the object of your desire or something like that, right? And that's this way of using object. So the object of a representation is what it's about. And because the representation um, is not only what it is, but itself, but it's also about something else, it also has a, another kind of reality, which is called its objective reality. The objective reality of the representation is, and there's different ways of saying this. Um, I'm, I'm not sure Kant is careful to always choose one of them, but it's, you know, I mean, it has to do with the fact that the representation has a certain thing as its object. Um, And this object can also be called the matter or content of a representation. Right? So that, in other words, there's a correlation between form and matter as usual. But in this case, the form is the representation itself and the matter is the object. Um, Kant isn't completely consistent about that. And see, in this, in, in the transcendental aesthetic, he sometimes says that sensations are the matter of the representation. But I think the, the way when he first introduces the, the term, he says it, I think, more carefully. He says the sensation is that in the representation which corresponds to the matter. Right? So this is the matter. Um, so, like, this is really important to keep in mind throughout the book because I think when, you know, most of the time when talk, Kant is talking, uses the word formal or is talking about form, um, and most of the time when he's talking about matter in this book, it's this kind of form and this kind of matter. This is matter. So, this is like, we use matter this way when we talk about subject matter. Right? Like, what's the subject matter of this book? Meaning, what's it about? So that phrase, that, that phrase comes from Aristotle. <laughs> Aristotle talks about the subject matter. Um, and, uh, but uh, John Duns Scotus, like an important late medieval philosopher, at some point remarks that it really should be called the object matter. <laughs> right? And this, right, this is why, because it's really the object. So, um, um, okay, so that's what a representation is. Um, but like so far, of course, this is totally abstract, right? Like I haven't said anything about how this works. <laughs> yeah. Um. When you're like defining object, can you bring it back to the table example of like, so if the, you said something about how like a representation of the table would be like a color or its shape, would the object be like just the color and shape on their own without defining them being part of the table? Well, I, I just, so I think I didn't get the analogy across very carefully. Yeah. So here's like, And what I was trying to say is when 
when you forget that the represent that a representation has this weird ability or uh, nature uh, that that something like shape doesn't. Like these these two are analogous, right? So just as the table has a shape, the mind has a representation. I'm not talking yet about like um, the table being the object of representation, <laughs> right? And but but what I am pointing out is that the table itself, right? Like the table doesn't, even though I was um, saying last time that it's sort of as if the object, rep, you know, represents me. <laughs> But again, according to Kant, unlike Leibniz, that isn't literally true, right? The, the, the table does not represent anything. So the modes the table have are only subjective. They don't have an objective reality. They don't, that is, they, they're not about something else. Is that clear? Um, I mean, again, like the, the, the main reason I'm pointing out this analogy is to make the term subject here seem less mysterious. <laughs> right? It's, I mean, it's, it, it is because of this use of subjective that, but not so much in Kant, but more like in the post Kantian idealists, that the term subject and subjective become very important. Right, but but at this stage we're just using subject in in the in the in a way where the table is also a subject. Yeah. If you put surfaces of the table on that circle, like uses for a table, where would that go? Uses for a table. Uh, well. According to Kant or according to Aristotle, or but I mean, so basically, sorry, the uses of the table are its final cause. Um, and at least for an artificial thing like a table, the final cause is external to the table itself, right? So it's, you know, the purpose is really in the person. I mean, for us, tables are mostly made in big factories, you know, that's. I don't know if there's really a person who made the table, but, <laughs> but, uh, but like at least the way Aristotle thinks about it, there's someone who had a purpose for a table and made a table for that purpose. And the purpose is really in that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the way Kant also thinks about artificial things. Whereas if you know I drawn here a plant or a non-human animal. It would get much more complicated because it seems to have its own purpose, right? So, but that's so that's that type of thing is what Kant mostly talks about in what's called the third critique, the critique of judgment. Um, so he's mostly not going to be talking about examples like that here. Really. Although, I mean, he does use examples like the concept dog, right? So that complicates things because they do have these weird. Really, properties. Uh, I mean, a table is also not a good example because it's artificial. I probably could have used this example, although <laughs> since this might be me, I, <laughs> but, I, uh, but I, I mean, right, this this actually is, is, is probably the most traditional example of, of a subject of predicates, a stone. Right. And so, I mean, I think it's clearer, it's even clearer in this case that the purpose of the stone is like, what's it for? Well, I mean, you could use it for something. It's not, I mean, but, uh, okay. Um, all right. So now I want to talk in more detail about, uh, about how the human, how human minds represent things according to Kant. I'm going to have to erase some of this stuff. Maybe one of the things. So maybe I'm just going to erase all, make the representation bigger. <laughs> so, um, okay, so our human representations according to Kant always have two parts. And the two parts are called 
concepts and intuition. Now, I mean, sometimes he'll say that there are two kinds of representation, concepts and intuitions. Um, that is calling each one of these by itself a representation. But um, I mean, uh, I think for it to be actually successful, it has to have both these points. And moreover, for, it to, for an actual human representation, I think has two parts, and one of them is an empirical concept, and the other is a sensible intuition. Okay, so like, first of all, what does intuition mean? Um, so um, all, these terms are all defined at the very beginning of the transcendental aesthetic. So this is on B33 at page, page 65 in the translation. By the way, is, is everyone doing okay? Uh, finding passages using those B page numbers that we are okay. Um, right, this so this is the very first sentence of the transcendental aesthetic in whatever manner and by whatever means a mode of knowledge. So now I have to stop and talk about this. <laughs> um, right, so the word that Kemp Smith was translating here as mode of knowledge is Kentness. Um, and so Erkentness, some people translate this as knowledge when it turns up in Kant, and others translate it as cognition. And so Kemp Smith translates it as knowledge. Now, I mean, there's there's certain good reasons to translate it as knowledge. Um, for example, uh, like if you look at the German translation of Locke's essay concerning human understanding, and book four is of knowledge. So in German, it's you know, uh, der Erkenntnis, <laughs> right? So like that is this this is a typical equivalent. Um, and uh, in later German, Erkenntnis Theorie came to mean what we mean in English by epistemology, right? So again, Erkenntnis is a good one for knowledge. On the other hand, um, two problems with the translation of Erkenntnis as knowledge. The first one is just kind of awkward which is that Erkentness is unlike knowledge of account now, right? So Erkentness has a singular and a plural. And in, in, in this passage, Kant, you know, so what Kant is saying is in whatever manner and by whatever, whatever means an Erkentness may relate to objects, right? But you can't say that with knowledge in English, a, a knowledge. I mean, it's certain weird uses of the word you can't make but not in this way, right? You can't use a knowledge to mean what? Like an act of knowledge? And well, so Kemp Smith cho chooses mode, a mode of knowledge, right? So whenever Kant uses their canvas of account now, and so he can't translate just using knowledge in English, he'll stick in this mode thing. But there's no word meaning mo mode in, in German. Right. Um, the other problem with knowledge as a translation is that uh, whatever Erkenness is, it, it doesn't seem like it always has to be true according to Kant. Sometimes he talks about false Erkenness, <laughs> which not really, at least for philosophers, are not really supposed to do with knowledge in English. Right. I mean, I'm not sure if that accurately tracks the way the word knowledge is really used in normal English. Hard to remember anymore after you've read enough philosophy. <laughs> so in any case, both of those things favor the translation of cognition um, 
but and I, I'm not sure which I prefer, but anyway, Kempsmith is due to that. Okay. So back to this. So in whatever manner and by other means, a mode of knowledge may relate to objects. And there I'm sure it is, I'm pretty sure it is Bitsian. Um, may relate to objects. Intuition is that through which it is in immediate relation to them and to which all thought as a means is directed. So the intuition is in immediate relation to the object. That's the definition of intuition. It's a representation or a part of a representation that's in immediate relation to its object. What does immediate mean? Well, it's the opposite of immediate. It means there isn't something else in between. Now, I mean, when I say there isn't something else in between, of course, um, there's things in between me and the table. There's like air or whatever, right? But it means there's no more representation between it and its object. It's the last representation, and from there on, you go out to the object. Right? Um, so, um, right? And, and I mean, we often use immediate, like do it immediately to mean do it right away, right? But that's that's really that just means don't do anything else in between. <laughs> that's what do it immediately literally means, right? So, but here we're not talking about time or anything like that, right? We're just saying that there's no other representation between the intuition and the object. So the it so right so Kant says, um, in all our knowledge, the thing that's to, that refers immediately to the object and is an immediate relation to the object is the intuition. And again, I think that's the definition of intuition. Right, so some of the things he's going to say about human intuitions are not part of the definition of intuition. For example, that they're all they're, they're all sensible, that they're all acts of our faculty of sense. Right, that's not part of the definition of intuition. But this, that it's an immediate relation to object, is part of the definition. Okay, and then the last part of the sentence was he says. Um, to which all thought as a means is directed. So I think, I mean, the place that Kemp Smith chose to put as a means, and obviously I'm not gonna talk about every sentence of the book in this much detail, but this one's pretty important, right? So the place where Kemp Smith put as a means in that sentence, um, I mean, it's a possible translation of the German, it's not a mistranslation but I think it disambiguates it in the wrong way. So, because it makes it seem like the thought is the means, right? To which all thought as a means is directed. It makes it sound like the thought is the means. And I mean, that is, as I said, that is a possible interpretation of the German. It's such a possible interpretation of the German that, um, that uh, many German interpreters of Kant have understood the sentence, but I think it's wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's the intuition is the means that the thought has to use to reach its object. So all thought ultimately aims at the intuition as its means of reaching the object. Right, and means is mythal, right? It's like it's like the the in-between thing, <laughs> right? That is the thought is um, um the thought is not doesn't immediately refer to its object because it needs a means to refer to its object. Okay, I mean, if there were 
and um, an intellectual that is active representation, like our concepts are, but one that didn't need another means to reach its objects, then that would be what Kant calls an intellectual intuition. Right? Because it would be intellectual, but it would relate, relate immediately to its object, so it would be an intuition. Um, sometimes he also calls that an intuitive intellect. That is the kind of being that has that faculty of intellectual intuition. I think those are completely interchangeable, right? An intuitive intellect is the same thing as a faculty of intellectual intuition. Yeah. So an intuition of faculty, I understand it, but is it, or is it like a way of representing? Uh, there is there is an ambiguity, which there is with many, I mean, not in this case, but so in many cases, the, the faculty and the acts of the faculty have the same name, right? Like volition can be used to mean the faculty of will, or it can be used to mean an act of the faculty of will. So that's the case with intuition, right? So the intuition is both the name of the power of representing an object immediately, and it's the name of the, the individual acts by which, is, does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 Um, um, right, yeah, means is, is mittel, and the, the German word for immediate is unmittelbar, right? So it's like in German, it's, I think it's, it should be, like I said, it hasn't been clear to all German Kant interpreters, but it should be clear that, you know, this thing is the mittel, you know, and it's unmittelbar, but this thing needs a mittel to be right. Um, so, um, Okay. Um, so, um, what does this have to do with the difference between sensibility and thought? Um, A number of different ways I could start here, but I'm going to start with this. So um, this is like an an older, like Aristotelian way of thinking about the situation. So suppose the object of my representation is um, Bucephalus. Bucephalus is in Alexander the Great's horse, right? So. Um, <laughs> Uh, it means cow head. <laughs> so, um, so I can represent Bucephalus by a non-essential quality that he has. For example, his color, right? So Bucephalus was black. So I can represent Bucephalus a little more than All right. I can represent Bucephalus um, as something black. I mean, in Greek, uh, you don't have to add the something, <laughs> right? You can just say, I represent Bucephalus as a black. <laughs> I mean, I guess we do kind of say things like that with horses, like this one is a bay. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so like you, you so blackness is not essential to Bucephalus, according to Aristotle. Why? Because what Bucephalus essentially is is a horse. And horses can be different colors. And moreover, Bucephalus could change color and still be the same thing that he was before. Um so 
So um, blackness is not essential to him. But nevertheless, uh, you know, I, I can represent him as something black and think about, oh, there's something black over there. And the thing that's black that I'm thinking about is Bucephalus. Um, but the thought is that it, I, um, a representation like that has to be immediate. It can't be immediate, right? So here's the representation of something black. Um, the object is supposed to be Bucephalus, right? I mean, it's Bucephalus I'm representing as black, not something else. So there's various ways this could, this mediation could work. So one could be that what I actually represent is the blackness in Bucephalus. Right. If the blackness of Bucephalus is some is a thing different from Bucephalus, that is, if you're a realist about the quality of blackness and you think it's right, that is, you think it's a race. So you're a realist about it. Then, then you can say the way this works is I refer to the blackness. I represent the blackness that's in Bucephalus, and. The reason I, I'm representing, therefore representing Bucephalus as black, is that the bl that blackness is in Bucephalus. <laughs> um, but suppose instead, and you might want to say this if you were a nominalist about the quality of blackness. That is, if you thought that blackness is not the name of anything. But saying that there's a Bucep there's a blackness in Bucephalus is just a way of saying that Bucephalus is black, and the blackness doesn't have it doesn't have its own thing that it that it names, right? So, um, so then you might say, well, uh, so I have to be directed at Bucephalus by another representation. And this representation better represent Bucephalus as what he is. Right, so this is the representation of Bucephalus as a horse. It, it refers to Bucephalus using his essential properties, using the what makes him the thing that he is. And this step here would be an intellectual intuition. Now, I mean, of course, like uh, there's more than one horse and Aristotelians are aware that uh, to represent this horse rather than some other horse, you, they'll, they'll explain how you need to use your senses. <laughs> um, but, uh, but they think of the intellect stopping its work here, so to speak, and, and, and referring straight to the horse. Um, so, uh, and you know, remember that. The, so they say that knowledge, episteme, consists of universals, right? Like this is why, you know. And they add, the last step you refer to a kind of thing. But but if you think of this as, as succeeding somehow, like in referring immediately to something outside of itself, this would be an example of an intellectual intuition, right? This is another representation in your intellect or understanding. This is what Kant would call the concept force. And it refers straight to Bucephalus. And it picks Bucephalus out. The reason it can refer straight to Bucephalus and it doesn't need another thing or another representation in between is because it picks Bucephalus out by Bucephalus's essential quality that makes Bucephalus the kind of thing that he is. So according to me, this is the first time I'm gonna talk about this weird phrase. When Kant says, 
thing in itself. Right, this is the German word Ding an sich. So an sich does mean in itself, but it means in itself in the sense of what's in itself means per se. Right, like it doesn't mean in itself in the sense in which in itself means like inside itself. That would be in sich. An sich means, we would say, I mean, you can use in itself to mean this in English, but in Latin you would say per se. <laughs> right, that is, you translate the on as per into Latin, not in. Um, okay, so a thing per se. So when you say it's a thing per se, Um, you need to say what is per se a thing, right? Like that's that's kind of um, it's missing a piece. What is per se a thing? And I think the answer that a thing in itself, that is a thing per se, is an object of intellection that is per se a thing. So it means that Bucephalus, for example, is the object of this intellectual representation just in so far as he has his essential realitas, which makes him the kind of thing that he is. And so when Kant says something like, we don't know things in themselves. He means our faculties don't have objects this way. All right, that's the first time I'm gonna try to explain that, but it's not the last time. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, um, and so that means that like, we don't get to a last concept that goes to the thing, right? Like no matter how far we go with concepts, we're still left with something um, immediate. It's still just like representing it as a black thing or whatever, right? Like we're, we're still representing it not as what makes it what it is, but by some kind of side characteristic, so to speak. Um, and um, when the concepts stop, we need another kind of representation to get us the rest away the our And that's the intuition. And so, um, Um, but going back again to B33, the beginning of uh, aesthetic. Um, Objects are given to us by means of sensibility, and it alone yields intuitions. They are thought. So I think the they here, this is often a really difficult question. What's the antecedent of the pronoun? <laughs> it's, it comes up all the time in philosophy. Um, objects are given to us by means of sensibility. So I think the they here means the objects. Objects are given to us by means of sensibility. It alone yields us intuitions. But the objects are thought through the understanding and from the understanding arise concepts. But all thought must directly or indirectly by way of certain characters relate ultimately to intuitions and therefore with us to sensibility because in no other way can an object be given to us. Right, so 
the, every one of the concepts refers to, thinks the object as having certain characters, right? So that that's like the list of properties version of a concept that I was discussing last time. Every one of the concepts has a certain like list of properties, so to speak, that the object has to have. Um, if we could literally list them, that would be the definition of the concepts. Um, but none of those ever tell us what the object really is. They never refer to it by means of its own essential characteristics. Um, and so uh, they're always still in need of something else to actually get them to the object. And so the something else is this intuition. So the intuition doesn't have a list of characters that the object has to conform to. What does the intuition have? Well, it has an effect of the object on me. Um, Right, so what I have is a concept that's a list of characters, or more generally speaking, a rule to which the object is supposed to conform. Now, um, we can see that since the concept is going to have to use a sensible intuition as its mean, the rule to which the object has to conform is going to have to be a rule about what effects it has on my senses. Right? So an empirical concept is a rule to which an object must conform, a rule about how it has to affect my senses if it's going to count as an object of this concept. But to actually refer to an object, I then have to wait for objects to actually affect me. And if one of them affects me in a way that conforms to the rule, then I've succeeded in representing it as that kind of object. Um, so, um, Now, I mean, you might say, oh, but maybe we don't need the concept to represent something. Can't we represent it just using this? Right? Like, now we understand why the concept by itself can't represent an object. It needs a means to get to it. But why can't the intuition, the sensible intuition by itself, represent the object? And so, uh, I mean, I'm going to say more about this later, but. Roughly speaking, I think the answer is that so to be an, an object of experience, what Kant calls a phenomenon, so an object of intellectual intuition can be called a thing in itself, or it can be called a noumenon, right? This noose is the Greek original that's translated as intellectus. Yeah. Right, so a noumenon is like uh, an intelligized. <laughs> it's right, this is a passive participle. Um, uh, there's another translation problem. We don't really have a verb. I mean, people who translate medieval philosophy use the verb intelligize in English, but it's not really English. <laughs> right. So anyway, a noumenon is an object of intellection, meaning in this case, it's an object of intellection alone, right? Because if you have an intellectual intuition, uh, um, you don't need another faculty of sense. One is enough, right? So these things are objects of intellection alone. But an object, an object of experience or empirical uh, 
uh, knowledge, which Kant calls a phenomenon. And it looks like these should be parallel, right? <laughs> but actually, this is like a medial passive form. It's not, yeah, it's not really, it's not something that's a phenomenon. <laughs> it's, it's something that appears, it's an appearance. Right, so what this kind of object of experience is, is like what constituted, it constitutes it is a rule by which it affects me. Remember, this is the rule that's in the object, not in me, right? So it has an empirical character, as Kant calls it. Um, and there the German is character, right? So it's like, that's what should be translated as character. <laughs> It has an empirical character. character. Anyway, um, it's it has an empirical character, meaning it has a certain rule in itself according to which it affects me. Um, so, uh, like that's the kind of thing I'm trying to represent. And in order to do that, I have to I have to um, my I have to represent it using part of that rule. If I just have this, I'm just being I'm being affected, but I'm not representing something as having a rule according to by which it affects me. But by adding this concept, I'm able to represent it as um, having its own rule by which it affects me, and that's like essentially what you know puts it outside of outside of my representation. Right. So um, now you might say, well, wait, it has the rule. And I don't, how can I form a concept that, so my concept isn't going to be the object's whole rule. It's not going to be the whole thing, right? And that's why uh, synthetic a posteriori knowledge is possible because um, I'm going to learn more things about the object's rule than they're contained in my concepts. Right, so like my concept required it to be an extended substance, but then I saw or felt it affect me in, you know, as heavy. <laughs> right, and so I learned that the uh, in, the object has more to its rule than I had in my concept. It's also heavy, <laughs> right? But but nevertheless, I mean, the my concept has to contain part of the object's rule. And how is that possible? Well, I form the concept by experience of the object to begin with. That's why this is an empirical concept. Um, now, I mean, there's another thing that has to happen in here. It's done by the imagination, and we'll talk about that later. But so, but but just basically, right, the way we acquire a concept. Is being by being affected in a certain pattern. And then our understanding, our intellect, forms the rule of that pattern and uses it as a concept. And so if we've done it correctly, we know that concept has an object. At least we know it had one at one time. Right? That something really did affect me that way. <laughs> that was the object. So that's why Kant is later going to say that it's there's no problem showing that empirical concepts are objectively valid. That is, that they represent at least a possible object. We know their object is possible because at one point it was actual. It's going to be much harder to show that pure a priori concepts are objectively valid. That's 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 basically the hardest problem at the center of the book to try to show that we have pure a priori concepts that are objectively valid. All right. Um, So I haven't talked about pure intuition yet. Well, um, so 
So if we look more into this intuition itself, we can say that it has a part, I mean, part is kind of a weird way of describing this. It might be better to call it an aspect or something like that. But anyway, it has a part that is the actual effect of this object on me now. That's called the sensation. Right? So the sensation is the effect of the object on me. Um, but there's more to the intuition in the in in the following sense. Like uh, remember, every representation has uh, its own formal reality as a mode of this subject. So um, so the intuition um, uh, so my sensible intuitions are different because they have different sensations, which are the effects of different objects or different effects of the same object. But um, they also have something in common because they're all modes of my subjects. They're all acts of my faculty of sensible intuition. So they all have something in common and um, that thing that they have in common, you could call their pure form. You could also call it something like their general form right or their generic form or something like that right like these are these are uh specified by their objects they're all they all belong to the same genus but they're specified by having different objects um but this pure so this pure form that they all have in common is basically like basically is my faculty of intuition right it's like what they all because what they again what they all have in common is that they're all modes of my faculty of intuition. Um, I think I shouldn't have talked about this yet. Really, because I've gotten into the second phase, talking about what pure the pure form of intuition was, without finishing the first phase yet. Um, so I guess I mostly finished what I wanted to say about that. I guess the only thing that I left out was I should have said this: this, you know, the rule according to which the object has to affect me in general is going to be really complicated, right? Like, let's say cinnabar, right? So. Uh, Cinnabar is red, but that doesn't mean it always causes a red sensation, right? Like if I turn off the lights, it doesn't cause a red sensation. So that's also part of the rule, right? Like if I turned off the lights and it still caused a red sensation to me, I would be like, I don't know what this is. It's not cinnabar, <laughs> it's like glowing, right? <laughs> so, um, um, you know, that complicated, um, like adjustment for what sensations should or should not be there to conform to this concept is the thing that the imagination is going to do. And it's what Kant calls the, the schema of the concept. So we'll we'll get to that later. Okay, but I want to now I'm going to go back to where I had jumped ahead, right? So I'm starting to talk about what the pure form of intuition. Um, and okay, so what does this pure form of intuition include? That is, like, what 
what character of its own does my faculty of sensible intuition have to have to make this possible? So, um, of course, I don't have any principle from which I can deduce what sensations I'm going to get or anything like that. Again, that's what makes this faculty passive. The rule by which it, it passes from potency into act is in the object, not in the subject. Oops. Um, right, by contrast, if they're a being with an intellectual intuition, would have a rule in itself from which the actuality of its objects could be derived. Right? It would be all active. And so that's why Kant says at some point we can we get we we don't know how to think about this except as a as a creative intellect. Right, like an intellect that causes its objects to exist by representing. Um, okay, but but that's not our case, right? We don't cause our objects to exist by representing them. We have to wait for them to affect us, and then we can represent them. Um, but in order to wait for them to, so let me try to say this as abstractly as I can, but, but, but it's hard to say it without already bringing time in. And Kant is going to, Kant can explain why it's hard to say it without bringing time in, because he's going to say time is the only example that we know of this, <laughs> right? Time and space, time, but Great. So in order to, so to speak, wait and see how the object affects me, there has to be a kind of order in which I'm affected. Now, again, in full abstraction, I can't say what that order is at all, right? But as I just tell you, we're talking about some being with a sensible intuition. We don't know what that order is. We don't, I mean, not just in the sense that we have a list of orders and we don't know which one it is, but we don't have a list of that, right? We don't know what kind of orders there could be in which a being could be affected. But if it's going to um, have to, uh, adapt its rule to the way it was affected by the object, there's going to have to be some kind of order in which it was affected. So uh, again, for us, right, it's this means to begin with, we have to literally be able to wait and see how the object will affect us. So that order, that order is a feature of our form of intuition, not of its object. Right? Like that's what all my sensible intuitions have in common. And again, so Kant's claim is now I'm now I'm getting to the bar when explaining what he means when he says space and time to the pure form of intuition, he means that, um, uh, you know, that order that characterizes our form of sensible intuition is space and time, spatio-temporal order. Um, so, I mean, uh, like, notice this doesn't mean, so like, here's one way that, that people often think when Kant says that like space is the form of external sense, 
they think space is kind of like a ghostly grid that you see inside your head. <laughs> and then it gets filled in by sensations. So the grid is the form and the sensations are the matter. Right? This, this, this is the wrong way. Okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you the wrong way to think about it, according to me, but it's a common way to think about it. Right. I mean, I think, first of all, this is taking matter in a different sense, in a more usual sense in philosophy, right? It's This is what the medievals call uh, materia ex qua, the matter out of which something is made, as opposed to the kind of matter we're talking about here, which is um, materia cir circa qua, the matter about which that is the subject matter, right? So here, like we're thinking of somehow we're thinking of space as like a shape that has to be filled in with sensations. Um, but um, if you see a grid, no matter how ghostly it is, no matter how much it's inside your head, it's already in space. <laughs> So, um, and if you think you can know things a priori by kind of looking at this grid and seeing what the grid is like, then you're imagining some kind of experience of an object in space. And so it's not a priori, it's a posteriori, right? Like, you know, if I find that when I imagine this grid, I try to imagine a triangle, the two sides um, together have to be longer than the third side. By like, like kind of like drawing things in this grid and seeing if they can fit. Um, that's a posteriori. Who knows, next, next time, maybe if I try it, I'll be able to do it some other way. Right, so so again, that's not the way to think about it. Space is the form of our sensible intuitions. That it, space is the form of external sense. I, I I haven't got to, and I may not be able to explain the difference between internal sense and external sense. I mean, that is, I can explain the difference between them, but why should we have both? And how, why, in what sense of external and internal, are they external and internal? But um, but in any case, space is the form of external sense, meaning uh, space is, as Scott often says, space is not an object of representation at all. Space is part of the way I represent this. And which part is it? It's the part that all my intuitive representations have in common. That is, it's the part that characterizes my, my faculty of sensible, of external sense in general. And that's what it means to say space is the pure form of external sense, according to me. <laughs> I keep adding according to me because no one agrees about what Kant means. And uh, um, therefore, if you ask anyone else, they'll probably tell you this is not the right explanation. Yeah. <laughs> Does the uh, the space simply determined that, or like our, our not concepts that are uh, pure intuition of space, simply determine that there's things that aren't us that are outside as opposed to us, or does it go further than that? I mean, is there, is there like relational aspects of space that are part of pure intuition, or is it just the like? Differentiation between us and not us. If that makes sense. Or is that all? Um, well, so, okay, remember, we're trying to, what we're supposed to get to here is the explanation of synthetic a priori mathematical knowledge. So, like, here's an example of, here's an example. Um, Two lines cannot enclose a space. 
That is, there's no such thing as a digon. There's no such thing as a, as a polygon with two straight sides and two vertices. Um, how do we know that? Well, um, how does space allow us? So I said how time is part of our ability to like um, wait and see how the object affects us. How is space involved in that? Well, like think of learning something from experience as first I check this, then I check this, then I check this, then I check this. All right, it's not going to work unless you're sure that you're not checking the same thing over and over. How do we know? That? Well, the thing in this direction can't be the same as the thing in this direction at the same time, which is as much as to say these two lines can't enclose a space. So, um, so the answer is like, yeah, our our form of intuition um, has to be sufficient to allow us to uh, um, know objects in pure. Um, and the characteristics it has are are like fundamentally. Um, aspects of that ability um, and our geometric knowledge about space is based on that. right so like on the other hand the fact that three lines can enclose a space right the possibility of a triangle so again right like this is me over here so now if i want to add I'm, now what i'm basically talking about is do these two things, does this one have to lie in some direction from this one, some distance? Um, and again, like if it didn't, like imagine that this is cinnabar here. And I'm trying to learn something about it. I have to be able to add it up this way. I want to know this piece of cinnabar weighs five grams. I have to be able to represent this as all cinnabar, but then I have to be able to represent it as all different cinnabar, and then I have to be able to add them all up. And the only way I can do that is in the simplest version, if the cinnabar is along the third side of a triangle and I'm at the vertex, <laughs> opposite angle. Um, um, so that, when I said that, I was already getting into what I take to be Kant's argument to show that space in particular is the form of external sense. Um, right, so like when, when he says, we can base geometrical a priori knowledge on it. But um, yeah, so I'm getting ahead of myself, but is that, did that help answer the question? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, um, okay. So I have five minutes left to try to discuss the the proof that space and time. I mean, I'm I'm probably not I'm not going to talk about time. Without, I'm going to just talk about the space proof. The time proof is very similar, although there's obviously really important differences between time and space. So it would be good to, to talk about both of them, but, um, but I don't have time, so I'm just gonna talk about space. It's, it's easier because I can draw it, <laughs> right? In fact, one of the differences between time and space is Kant says, we can only represent time by drawing a line in space. Um, because the parts of time never exist simultaneously. Um, but what does that mean? I mean, if it means they don't exist at the same time, well, of course, they're different parts of time. Not exactly what it means. But anyway, let me get back to space. Um, 
So, um, I mean, so there's two parts of the basic argument. The first one is called the metaphysical exposition of the concept of space. And the other one is called the transcendental exposition of the concept of space. The concept of space, I think, is um, the concept of a space, right? The concept of space is a concept, and it has so it's a that is it's a universal concept, and it has lots of individuals that fall under it. And I think the things that fall under it are spaces. I've just drawn two dimensional spaces, but I think there's one and two three dimensional spaces fall under it too. One of the one of the things that Kant says we know a priori about space is that it's three dimensional, but I don't know how he understands. The role of that. I mean, I can't say something nice about that, like I just said about the Euclideanness of space. <laughs> um, but um, and I guess I should say, like, this is a true right. Real space is not Euclidean. There are diagonals of real space, right? There's like one quasar that you can see in two different directions. Because there's two straight paths from us to the quasar. You don't know what a quasar is, it's something very far away. Okay. So it looks like there's one here and one here, but it's really the same one. Um, okay, but uh, well, that's why the theory of general relativity was so surprising. <laughs> okay, let me get back to Kant, right? So, um, I understand the difference between these two parts, but I don't understand, I can't relate that to the meanings of the terms metaphysical and transcendental. So I'm not gonna try, but I'll just say, in, like in this part, Kant basically talks about, um, like, uh, let's look at this representation of space and see what's in it, so to speak. And this part, the way he himself puts it is, now we're going to look at it as the condition for further synthetic a priori knowledge. That is, this part is going to talk about how it's the foundation of geometry. Um, all right, I don't understand. You know, I, maybe I'll get back to say something about this part next time. I just want to introduce the arguments because there's four arguments in the metaphysical exposition of the concept of space. Um, so the first one is to find things outside me and each other, space must be presupposed. So I think that's basically what I was just talking about now, to find things outside of me and each other. Space must be proposed, be presupposed, meaning like uh, I can't, so again, it's it's it, it's not like meaning if I look at what goes into my considering different things, I'll see that it's based on these properties of space. And therefore, I can't have gotten my representation of space from experience. It's a condition to the possibility of experience for being like me. So I can't have learned it from experience. The second one, cannot represent the absence of space or that there is no space, but I can think space as empty of objects. Think in the in the time version of this argument, he says it a little bit differently, and I think in a way that makes it clear what he's thinking. He says, "I can't remove my representation of time. I can't go over either because I have another class after this. <laughs> I guess I'll just say what this one means, and then I'll I'll finish next time. So I think what this means is 
try to say, so first of all, try to say what the space the table is in is with without the table. That's easy. I mean, maybe not easy, but anyway, you, it seems doable, right? Now, try to say what the table is without the space that it's in. I mean, all the properties of the table are extended properties. Like, what are they without the space that they cover? So I think, like, I, I think that's the basic thing that's going on here. And hopefully, if you think about that right, it will get out of, because again, the question would be, if it just means try as hard as I can, I can't imagine that there's no space. Maybe tomorrow I'll try harder and I'll be able to. That would be a posteriori. So it has to be something that's like, every time I represent a table, I know that it, I couldn't have that representation without space. All right, I'm sorry, I can't take a question now because um, like I have to get going. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll see everyone next week.